you for coming to our talk today on Evolving Mixed Reality. I'm Jono. I'm Samantha Gorman. I'm Ron Gall. Uh, Brian Schwab. Uh, so before we really launch into the talk, uh, I just want to kind of frame the space that we're talking about a little bit. Um, so right now, you know, a lot of AR that we see looks like this. Uh, a lot of it is sort of single plane, user directed, um, you know, tabletop sixed off AR. And people have done really, really cool, incredible, inspiring, exciting work there. Uh, but I think that also everybody in this room probably has this sense of like, this is the first step towards this uh, like true mixed reality thing. Um, so to draw a couple examples, what we mean when we say that, um, you know, that can mean everything from immersive games. Sorry? XR, XR. <laughs> uh, everything from you know, immersive games to industrial training to uh, IoT controls. Maybe I'll throw more examples out there, the kind of stuff you're thinking about. I mean, the thing is, is it's, it's where we're going is it's, it's just compute anywhere, pixels anywhere, with whatever device you use. That's where we want to hit. We're yeah. a long way from there. Absolutely. Uh, so let's meet each of our speakers, Ron. Hi, everybody. So my name is Ron Gall, and I work at the Interactive Media Group at Microsoft Research. Just to make sure everybody understands, I'm not part of HoloLens. So don't take anything I say as something that is going to happen with HoloLens. We are working with them for my, uh, in Microsoft Research, but I know as much about them as I know about Magic Leap. So <laughs> we contribute ideas. We have no idea what they, what they are doing with them. So in our group, uh, we are working on several things that are relevant to this uh, presentation and also on other things. We started to focus on uh, AR and VR and XR, sorry, uh, uh, about five to six years ago, and we did a couple of projects. Uh, in our group, we develop devices, we research ideas of how to design to these environments, and we have a lot of fun doing it, and uh, it's pretty cool. So that's it. Um, hello, so I'm Samantha Gorman, and I'm the co-founder of Tender Claws, and we're about a 10-person studio. And um, we're often, we're artists, directors, designers that are often commissioned to think creatively around emerging tech, um, often the, at the same time as that tech is actually being developed. Um, so this is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Tendar, which was our collaboration with AR Core, right when AR Core was being developed. Um, and as a case study, I was interested in going kind of away from tabletop, not because I don't think it's a really great area, but I want to do something more room scale with AR. And um, it's, Tendar is essentially a long form AR content app. It's about three weeks of content and it reacts meaningfully to the user's environment. So it has modes that can address an, a user at home, a user in the outside world, multi-person and social use. And at the core of Tendar's design is a strategic use of our device, of on device rather, um, mobile vision, such, such as object recognition, sentiment analysis, to create a virtual friend and pet that can evolve over the three weeks by feasting on the player's emotions, the tears and joy of you and your loved ones, and responding to objects in the player's world. So Tendar is actually, we're gonna talk a little bit about machine learning later, but it's a fictitious company that ostensibly created this virtual pet Guppy to improve its model for emotion recognition. And by inviting users to build a relationship with this guppy, it teaches, as you play the game, a little bit about what machine learning is and how some of the object recognition in the game works itself. Guppy in itself is a computer vision model that's inspired by neuro, uh, various neurobiology research that attempts to emulate and automate how real vision systems operate and identify patterns. Um, it's kind of both a lit literal and figurative representation of machine learning since as you are playing the gu game, Guppy must eat and absorb the image, the data sets, the images of your emotions to survive. And by eating those emotions, he's being trained on how to process and understand human emotions more accurately. And you know, hilarity ensues as, as things kind of devolve over time. Um, here's a brief teaser. So cute. 
and pretend there's like, you know, fun instrumental music in the background. <laughs> So some of the things you're seeing in the video, um, there's various modes using both the front and back facing camera of obtaining emotion from a multiple, not just you as yourself, but multiple people in the space. You can pull off the emotions from their face. Um, they turn into kind of these wonderful digestible blobs that Guppy can eat and sample and then give you a fortune of what you're really feeling. Um, so there's a, the sentiment analysis aspect, you also see some of the object recognition, which is a, a context dependent on the various objects that can be in any of these spaces that the user will inhabit, and there's hints of the game, like how to find them. Um, some of the things that it also does is, it thinks about, well, I guess to step back for a second, and we can talk more about this, but the challenge of like why we did this project kind of early on into the AR space was that our main interest in XR in general is that we see it as a rich space to prototype interfaces and models that kind of hint at or lead to a future of spatial computing. Um, that it's sort of the forerunner of like what it will actually be in that environment. So we value interaction design as a key a key element for making these spatial uh, digital content that feels like truly present. <clears throat> okay, and thanks. And there's a, uh, actually a module that's not just world facing, but that's self facing, where this is um, through, you can decide to make the food you're feeding your fish by actually engaging with the fish and teaching it and, you know, emotions. And it's kind of this like emotional dialogue you're having with the pet that then like results into this very, um, I guess, uh, kind of like a little bit uh, upsetting, you know, distillation of your emotions into food pellets that you feed. <laughs> and that's how, you know, the fish gets his image set data. And then you get this wonderful little like fortune um, from Tendar that analyzes like, yes, this is accurate. This is how you feel. Um, you know, you can choose what to, to, what to do about that. So one of the things that I think this panel in particular is relevant is that Tendar has to work with all kinds of player context mm -hmm. and aspects of change to their world. Um, how do we design for a space where the content, the content should be anchored to the user's world and have, meaningful, and have meaningful semantics with the user's world without feeling overly tethered to a surface? It can happen on a bus, on a grocery store, on a toilet, you know, you name it, act. The other uh, sort of unique thing about Tendar is it's thinking about AR for social play. So there is a module that we often show at conferences and galleries that is for two players. And one of the things that is happening there with the front facing camera is the, the emotions of the two players are actually playing off each other and the audio is splitting to different ears. So the different players are getting kind of um, live procedural updates on what the other player might be feeling which then like changes how they're engaging with each other on screen, but it also changes how two users can engage physically in the space with a device and what that user intent means for like moving an AR device around that space and how it engages, changes the design of the experience or the application. Cool. All right. um, hey guys, uh, my name is Brian. Uh, I'm working as a director on a thing called the Interaction Lab and so if you go to the next thing, it's basically a rapid prototyping group. Uh, over the last four and a half years, we've probably made six or 700 prototypes. Um, you can just pop through them, I don't care. Um, we did a bunch of things. We did first turn on of all of the hardware and software and perception features as they came online. We tried to give really fast feedback and guidance to those features as they got built. We tried to like, <sighs> think about how you would consume those features as a dev so we could like actually iterate a little bit on the SDK before it got there. 
we did a bunch of documentation and you know best known practices, and then we finally did a lot of knowledge sharing. And then slowly over the as we walked as we walked up to launch, we kind of like pushed a little bit further in that direction. And the team about for the, about the last year or so made a bunch of MR uh, um, little moments called Magic Kit. That was a uh, a bunch of stuff that we put out there specifically just to give some tiny little taste of spatialized computing and then I like all the source code in, in Unreal and Unity so that people could actually pull the, di pull the dials apart and see what made it happen and, why, and when it fell apart and which perceptual cliffs were important and which one weren't and why everything was doing it. So um, the, source, the source is all up there on, on our website. Hey, I'm Jono. Uh, I'm on the labs team at Unity. Uh, I'm leading UX dev for uh, Mars, or Mix and Augmented Reality Studio. Uh, and that's a upcoming set of tools for uh, building XR experiences, MR, AR experiences, um, with a more visual, approachable workflow. Uh, so for example, we do simulation. We'll talk kind of at length about simulation in a, in a sec. Um, but this is an example of how this example game content would fit into this simulated living room. Um, we also have these uh, visual tools for specifying the, the kinds of parameters of objects that you're seeking. So here I'm saying, like, I want my hero character to be on, it's going to be on a surface. The surface is going to be, you know, in some range of size, in some range of elevation. You can, like, see that here abstractly and then also simulated, see how it actually matches. Um, of course, face content, right, is a big part of uh, commercial AR right now. Um, so we have workflows for that, and you can see here that I'm simulating uh, live against the webcam. Notice that we're not in play mode. This is at edit time. Um, I think this also kind of shows you the shape of things to come in terms of uh, augmenting individual objects. So I can say like I have this canonical version of an object that I can mark up, and then you know see see how that fits against um, you know real fed examples. Uh, here's that first scene that you saw running running on device. Um, you see a little sample of our uh, some of our procedural tools and utilities here. Uh, this this has a rule in it that says, um, see any horizontal surface that's not the floor should fill with this terrain texture, this terrain material thing. Uh, and then also those and the floor get nav meshed so our character can walk around. And then also all the uh, raised surfaces should build a ladder down to the floor. Um, so you can see all those elements. And one of our goals with this project is um, to be able to open up XR experiences and XR development to people who are not programmers necessarily. Uh, so to that end, everything you see here has no additional scripting. Like this is all just kind of out of the box tooling. And then also we're looking at uh, tools on device. This is a uh, design mockup of using a phone to capture a space and then to start to uh, identify layout and rules and yeah, content descriptions that you want uh, right there, you know, in the real in the real space. So ultimately, you would pull this into the editor and use use this room as a simulation that you can test against, and also use um, the rules that I'm starting to set up here as the beginning of your content scene. So I'm saying, like, if I find you know a surface that looks kind of like this one, then put my put my hero on it, and that would generate that rule that you saw earlier. Okay, so that's who we are and kind of where we're where we're all coming from. So hopefully now you you know spent the setup to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we're interested in in the XR space and where, where we're going with all this. Um, so let's talk about why AR is complicated. What are some of the many challenges of it? Um, want to start us off? Um, and in terms of us, we are trying to think about how to compose an AR experience that could be transferable to different environments of the user and still have semantic significance for those environments um, and part of one of the things that we were thinking about is, for instance, all the, the objects that Guppy can recognize that uh, he can respond to and that the users kind of, there's Easter eggs and it's seeded throughout the game what these objects are, but users can go out and find these objects in their world. Um, and they started with like a thousand, which we can talk about this later, and then works our model down to about 200 of these. Um, and trying to figure out um, how, like if like a fire hydrant in like one context may not look like the fire hydrant in another context. So how do you design um, the, the AR experience to be able to like recognize those and like the interface that comes off of it and the, like the visual design will be different depending on the different shape for what's on the screen and what the user encounters. Um, so thinking really, trying to think broader than um, just ma like mapping a space to almost mapping a world 
So actually, I had a question I wanted to ask you about that one. Like, since since you recognize all these objects mm -hmm. that Guppy can respond to, like, how do you um, you know how do you keep people from missing so much of the content that is mm -hmm. there or that is possible? Yeah. Um, so the actual content is actually um, it's like writing worked with eight writers over five months, and it's like a whole giant corpus of text messages that is ge partially generative and partially written that can come up in response to things the user does with Guppy in the AR world. Um, so there's like weeks of content, but um, parts of those peppered in within those messages is kind of hints about, he's learning about the human world. You're training him to like see and find objects of like things he may want to, may want to see. Um, so he like, oh, you know, I, I heard about this, this type of device that, you know, does X, Y, and Z. So that's a more explicit example. Um, but that can get players to like go out and bring their AR, you know, application into other spaces in the world. Um, if it's something that you can find at a grocery store, for instance, or, um, you know, a, like a car wash. Um, there's also a module where Guppy sends you on excursions explicitly to like, for instance, a grocery store to talk about what he wants to see in the fish aisle. Um, so, you know, there's elements that can work with that. Yeah. I, I, I actually think that one of the biggest challenges of AR is not just that the experiences themselves are tough to make, it's that the player expectation is essentially nil. Like they don't know what to think or do or if they can even move or if physics works or whatever. And so like one of the challenges of making experiences for, for XR is to quickly and sort of transparently educate your users on what the experience is even gonna do and what they can expect. If I'm sitting in front of a screen, I know where all the pixels are gonna come from. I know where the controls are. And, and now that's all gone. And so like, like people don't even know where to look unless you explicitly kind of make that contract with them very quickly. <coughs> and they don't know what to do if you don't make that explicit contract with them fairly quickly. And that's one of the biggest challenges for now. That's sort of a moment in time challenge, right? Yeah. And in my case, the, um, we, we started to work on this area about six years ago when devices with an array of sensors starting to appear. And we faced uh, more, you know, we, we were in uncharted territory and I'm coming from the background of uh, geometry processing, and then we found ourselves with uh, a lot of data streaming fused to some extent into our application, and okay, what do I need to do in order to create a simple demo? And then we started to find out that design tools are really missing. So you get a lot of data, you get a lot of uh, intelligent analysis of what's going on in the scene around you, but as a programmer, not that I'm an XR developer, but as a simple developer with tools like Unity on Unreal, I'm able to create stuff, but what stuff should I create and where should I put stuff in, in order to adapt to the environment around me? And this is what led us to start thinking about design tools that will help developers or, or will allow developers to work in this environment without going through all the low level geometry analysis and whatever. Well, so to that, to that end, <clears throat> you know, of course, one of the, maybe the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges is just the unknown nature of the real world, right? We don't know where the user's gonna be. Samantha's been talking about that of, you know, are they on a bus, are they in a field, are they in a grocery store? Um, and how do, you, how do you deal with that? Um, so Ron, you wanna just kind of keep, keep running with uh, rules? Sure, yeah. Sure. There, uh, oh, sorry. sorry to there was something I was going to say about the actually from the dev perspective, the most challenging thing and why it's important for the tools that these guys are building is getting everything to play nice together, especially mm. if you're trying to enhance the future of like XR by adding all these other like world sensing modules, just that the combination of getting those things to play nice is difficult. And that's why what it's some of the, what these guys do is so important. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to talk about the challenging matrix of devices and capabilities and all that craziness. Uh, so, so this, you know, the, the nature of the thing that we're trying to get at, right, in, in a lot of ways you could think of it like CSS on the web, where we, we talk about, like I wanna, I wanna specify some parameters and some rules that will let, uh, you know, in the CSS case, if my browser window is really small or if it's really large, my content will, you know, intelligently adapt. Uh, in this case, we say, you know, if the user's in that room or that room or the bus or whatever, um, that their content adapts. Um, so to that end, 
Uh, you wanna take this one? Yeah, so continuing on what I said before, we started in a more of an engineering, a bunch of engineers trying to find a solution to a common problem. We wanted to create amazing, magical VR and AR demos, and we had the mesh detected by some kind of uh, depth camera, and then we asked ourselves, what do we need more? So we started to throw balls in order to create magical uh, physical simulations, and then we found out about holes in the meshes. And then we thought about how to fix this problem and how to allow a more plausible kind of experiences. And then we started to think about, okay, suppose I want to create an application, where should I put stuff? Where should I hang my synthetic objects in the scene? I, we started to think about consistency, adapting to different environments, adapting to different environments from the first frame or asking the user to scan more data in order to, to adapt even better. And the, the virtual objects needs to sit in nice locations, nice regarding color, regarding contrast. I don't want to see, especially with additive devices, I don't want to put stuff on a, a window facing the sun outside. All kind of rules that, when you think about them, seem simple, but we didn't want to go through this pipeline every new demo that we want to do, because we said to ourselves, this is a common set, this is the basic point. I need to start, I need to have tools to start developing immediately. And of course, we took into account uh, uh, multiple users in the same environment that I want to put, even the simplest thing, I want to put something in the room that is visible or, or, or is uh, viewed by two or more users, then it becomes a simple point that you can fix or, or you can solve theoretically very easily if you have all the data. And this is what we wanted to save the developer. Don't take all the data, we will try to help you in this regard. So, and of course, multiple uh, uh, application in the same area. I want to open a new application. I want the previous applic open application to move gracefully and allow me, or uh, allow application not to fight over real estate of my screen and over my pixels. So, so we developed a simple service called Flare. This is before XR, so it's fast layout for augmented reality. And, uh, we used declarative rules, which are very simple. You just state the rules that you, uh, you want your experience to follow, such as uh, I want these TV screens to be hanged on a wall. And this brings us to a, 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 another point, what is a wall and how much semantic information do I have about the scene? So we started with put it on any vertical uh, a flat surface. We don't care if it's a wall or something else, but the nice thing about rule-based system is that the more information you have, the more intelligence your rule can become. And then we started to figure out ways to solve such a rule system, because this is a, a kind of optimization problem, but a very non-convex optimization problem. And uh, we started to look for iterative methods and iterative on purpose in order to be able to invest as much time as we have. We wanted a solution, we wanted a good solution, but if we don't have 30 seconds to invest in it, we wanted a plausible or as good as possible solution in two seconds. And uh, we started to, we, we, we used a couple of methods of solving it and we achieved a very surprisingly good results on very low end devices. And this is what motivated us to continue to look into the matter. So this is a simple example. And, and uh, I wish I could uh, play it, uh, is it playing? Yeah, it's playing, yep. Okay, so this is an example of building a racetrack in the room and the rules that uh, were, were used to construct the racetrack is put a number of points in the room at a certain distance, range of distance between them, and that are visible. Each point can view the next point, view in the sense of there is nothing blocking the, the path. 
And we construct the ray track using the spline between these points. And when we increase the number of points, we see that we adapt to the environment. The, the ray track is created larger and larger in the different, uh, and of course, at some point, you might not be able to uh, adhere to all the rules, but if your rules are valid in your environment, you'll get a solution which is surprisingly nice. We were surprised, at least I personally was surprised. <laughs> uh, and this, are, this is the same example, and the nice thing is that it's the same set of rules to design all the, the to, to construct all these uh, examples, and we found out that rules are very easy to teach people, but it's not as clear as, uh, the problem is that you always, as a human, needs to decide, okay, I know the rules, but which one has more priorities? And which one I want to follow no matter what, and which one I can allow to, to degrade from or not fulfill fully. So the, it is a kind of art, but at least the basic idea is very simple to explain, and we actually had developers work with it, and it needs getting used to because you, you find out the difference between in the user first room and visible to the user because you have stuff that uh, can block your view. And, but, but it's very easy to integrate multiple users, multiple applications, additional semantic data that will become available over time, object recognition, and whatever. So, and, and this is where the connection with Unity uh, 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 happened because Unity apparently is going more or less in the same direction and then... We, yeah, we, we came across the Flare paper um, as we were working on, on our project and uh, it was very exciting to us because we're like, yeah, like this, this is exactly, exactly the kind of approach that we're, that we're taking and um, you know, just seeing the results that you, that you had there was, was very uh, encouraging on, on that route. Um, so, yeah, let's see. Do you want to talk about this one? Ah, uh, this is another example of um, graceful adaptation. So we, we constructed a set of rules to put the creature in circle facing a middle creature. We didn't define the, the radius of the circle. And when the scene change or, or uh, 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 obstacles appear, such as inanimated or a human goes and disturb the... the the previous uh, uh, arrangement, we simply added another rule to resolve, but be as close as possible to the previous solution. So everything is very, it's like Lego, everything fit together. The only question is how much time do you have to, invent, to, to invest in order to find a new solution? And it's highly, the, the minute you have a, a strong GPU around, it's a matter of milliseconds. On low-end device, it becomes an issue, so. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I mean, like, like I was saying, we're, we're really excited to find Flare. I'd recommend everybody read it, by the way. Just Google Flare, Microsoft Research paper, you'll, you'll get it. Uh, really good read. Um, and when we read it, we said, <clears throat> like, yes, this is exactly you know, the, kind of, the kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, so we, we have very analogous uh, systems to everything that, that Ron just described. Uh, we talk about real world objects, which is a, a scene object in your hierarchy that represents a real thing. So I could be like, this, this game object in my scene represents a table in the real world. Um, the complexity, of course, is that table may or may not actually end up existing, so that's a whole thing. Um, real world objects are made out of conditions. So you can see in this object, uh, I'm defining so I have an object in the inspector there called floor. I'm defining it with a tag condition, looking for the tag floor. Um, that's provided to us by uh, Magic Leap and HoloLens. And then on the other platforms that we support that don't give us that for free, uh, we, we do some extra logic to fill that in so that we can just say every platform knows what a floor is. Um, that's actually enough for the floor. In this case, I've added some extra conditions just to illustrate the case a little bit more. I could also throw something on there saying I'm looking for something that's horizontal, I'm not looking for something that's vertical or something that's off axis. Uh, I'm also, I also have a condition there for I want a surface that's of a particular range of size that's acceptable. So we use those conditions, kind of stack them up to describe that real object in this sort of atomic way. Uh, and then, as, as Ron described, right, we, we then have this, this rules concept that sort of takes all that at a, you know, at a higher level. We say like, okay, when there is a floor, 
stick water on it when there is a raised surface, stick grass on it, um, et cetera, right? And you can see those rules kind of in the lower left of the screenshot there. Um, and see how they're all matching in this simulated uh, kitchen environment here. And then, uh, yeah, Ron was also just describing uh, degradation, right? So, so we, we call those fallbacks and we say, um, basically you can describe the sort of ideal case where you're like, oh, I, I have this app that like you need a two-story building and six different walls and three humans in it and have some crazy set of expectations, but then say, if that fails, then here are some more, you know, some simpler, 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 simpler cases down to the point of like, oh, I don't even have tracking. Now what, right now you're in a 3DOF experience or you're in a just a 2D experience at that point. Um, Brian, you mentioned at one point the basketball thing. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so I was going to just mention um, this isn't super new. Like, like we have had very complicated game AIs in the past with, that, that use very similar systems. Uh, I worked on um, uh, a basketball game for Sony Computer in the early 2000s, and we had almost uh, uh, five megabytes of, of, of AI data that was, it, it, was, it was just pure... HTML of, of situations, everything from, oh, if, if you've got the ball in front of you and, and, and nobody in front of you, take a shot all the way till in the last three seconds of the game, if you're this particular player and the guy in front of you has a broken leg, do this thing. Like, like all the way down to that level of specificity. And so these systems have been around for a while. I think that they're not typically needed for most, for most games. It's more games that have a, that had a high degree of, of sort of knowledge base, which the real world represents the largest knowledge base that we need understanding that, that there is. And so that's why they're starting to make kind of this resurgence. Uh, the other thing that's nice about those rule-based systems is that they're human readable. You can look at them as a human and you can say, I, I understand that in the last three seconds, if you're this guy and there's this blah, blah, blah. You can actually understand that very easily. And so the reason why we had these huge AI systems on that particular game was that um, by being human readable, we could have a small army of, of hardcore basketball game designers who could like crank, crank stuff out um, year after year and, and add to that massive database of, of AI uh, scenarios that, that it could respond to. And so it was, it was sort of a beautiful, a beautiful system so that, so that you know, non-technical staff, it was much more accessible to them. So on the point of AI, you know, make, making a big comeback here, um, we promised we'd get into machine learning a little bit. Do you want to take us away there? Um, yeah, I think when we were uh, talking about this panel before, we had some interesting discussions and in interplay about like the use of machine learning. Um, in our case, I think it's actually there's it's such a wide topic, but um, ways to sense the player's world and ways to use. Um, existing machine learning mod models and modules to incorporate that into an AR experience as a dev as ways to uh, sense the player's world and give you more data, um, I think is a really strong push towards the future of how we're, we could engage with AR. And for us in particular, no tools existed to really do that well at the time. Um, so it was learning a lot about how to um, operate within different systems and bring them into Unity. Um, and for, we actually use parts of uh, TensorFlow and to, as part of the object recognition and TensorFlow was not at that moment uh, compatible with Unity so that we had to kind of build a wrapper around that and um, then essentially take the model. One of the models we were using in TensorFlow was some, one that was created at Stanford and it can recognize up to a thousand, like, a thousand plus objects. But the image set it was trained on was mostly dog breeds. Um, so this is where kind of like the design thinking of being a dev working with like machine, uh, you know, well, uh, machine learning models comes into place is that we knew that we wanted the fish to um, have an Easter egg where he could maybe identify all, take advantage of all the specific dog breeds. So we can very sensitively know the difference between like a German shepherd and a schnauzer but like very intense and uh, intensely because we were, we took that model and we binned it into objects that were recognizable and objects that could 
make creative design decisions for what would be in the player's world. Um, and there were some very obvious things it couldn't recognize. So very early on, we had to make the decision that, okay, we're going to just bin X number of these objects into chickens. So all types of, you know, like animals that walk in this particular way have been chickens. And, the, and narratively, the fish is gonna have a fixation with chickens. And therefore, that's why in this machine learning model, we're gonna compensate that with narrative by like just, you know, talking about his chicken obsession. Um, design around it. Yeah, design, <laughs> designing around modules is like one way to, you know, I think incorporate that into like the development of, of the game. The, the thing is, is that anytime you have a massive soup of data and you're looking for temporal patterns, machine learning is an obvious choice. And, and because this is a new field, a lot of what we're talking about is machine learning, but don't, don't be put off. It, it, a lot of what we're also talking about is stuff that essentially needs to be built at a very low level so that most people can just use it as a function, like where's the nearest table? should be a function you can call, as opposed to let's quickly ram through all of the geometry and run a learning blah, blah, blah on it and so that we can find the flat surfaces and we'll declare certain types of flat surfaces to be tables. That's the thing that the low level should do. And a lot of what has evolved over the past four years is we've gone from you know, almost no semantic understanding of a, of a geometric soup to, to we're getting more and more and more through machine learning and other analytic methods, we're getting more and more semantic data that we can start to provide to, to, to developers. Yeah, we were debating, um, you know, when we were talking about this, we were debating, you know, should, we, should we tell everybody in the room, go learn machine learning? Um, and you know, I think Brian just, just touched on that a lot, where like in, in a lot of cases that's really on, on us, right? It's on the platform holders here um, to provide that. Uh, and that, you know, I mentioned earlier that we, one of our goals on my team is to uh, make this approachable to people who aren't programmers. Uh, so we, like, like Brian was saying, like, you know, we wanna be able to just provide a model that's like this one recognizes tables and chairs and you know, household objects, and this one recognizes types of dogs. Uh, and you can just you know, plug that in and use it. That said, yeah, I think we would all encourage everybody to at least like get the shape of machine learning, just like understand like what is it, like what are people talking about, and um, you know what are the what are the general techniques used there. So even if you're not you know a hardcore programmer, even if you're not going to do you know make your own model, um, it is still just a very interesting thing to to know about, and it it will help a lot in this X, a, XR journey. Yeah, from a dev perspective, I think that's true. I think understanding a little bit about it helps underpin certain design decisions that you can make in terms of knowing what's available um, to you and what types of things you can do. 100%. Who wants to talk about the user? So the user is just as varied as the environments. Uh, uh, you know, even if you talk about just the quote unquote human hand being this natural input, it's like, maybe. Like, what if you have rheumatoid arthritis? What if you really, really favor one hand over the other, even if you are left-handed? You like using your right hand. What if you just don't culturally think that this means yes. You know what I mean? Like, like there's a number of things that, that have absolutely no bearing. And so user input is in many ways almost the same problem as world understanding is, is user understanding. And so a lot of what we end up doing on this side is, is the exact same problem with a different user, with a different data set. Uh, uh, like in exactly the same way that head pose is a fused input with a number of different things, hardware, software, and, and human understanding, right? That gives you head pose. Uh, knowing where the hand is going is very much a hardware, a software, and a human understanding problem. You no longer just have a joystick that you're reading the value of, a, of, an, of an analog float coming out of it. And so um, this is also a very tough problem, and, it, and, it, and again, is requiring the platforms to, to up their game as far as delivering uh, solutions to, to to this kind of understanding for, for the average dev. For the sake of time, we're just gonna, gonna plow through uh, procedural content, learn up on it, same, same idea as uh, machine learning, like it'll, it'll do you well to, to check in on like generating meshes. Um, but like you saw earlier, like we're, we're gonna be providing some utilities for that and you know, there'll be more utilities, but it's, it's important. Does anybody wanna touch on that before we roll on? So let's talk a bit about uh, some specific tools and workflows that that uh, you know that are there or that are coming online. Uh, for one thing, simulation. I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the simulation view inside of Mars, and here I'm just going to kind of click through a couple different spaces, like how would this content work in this room versus that room versus that room versus you know, anywhere else. And here I'm swapping into a secondary simulation view uh, where I can actually simulate as a device. Uh, so here you can see that 
if you look in the left panel, you, you kind of see all the rays and the, the um, planes, the surfaces being generated by that device. Um, so this is a very coarse version of like, generally this is how a phone or a headset would, would see the world. Um, so in this way you can, you can see like, as I move through the world, how would I expect my content to adapt? And you can, you can pick up a lot of issues there. Uh, and then another tool that I, that I want to point out is um, debugging in the editor. Uh, so here I see in my simulation that one of these trees didn't show up. Uh, so I'm going to this compare mode where I'm like, why did it not show up on this surface that I'm expecting? And sorry, those, the text is a little tiny there, but what's going on is uh, in the inspector in those conditions that I was describing earlier, we're showing like this one is failing, this one, like the surface is too small. So I say, okay, you know, adjust for that condition, include that also, and now you see it, see it pop in there. Um, so I think that the idea of being able to ask your content, like, hey, why aren't you matching against this, this data that I expect you to work on is um, very complicated in this, in this context and very useful to have some, some tooling around. Oh, so here, this, uh, there's a, one of the things was you can just fly around a little RC car. And so I'm just flying it around real quick. And then I push pause, bam. And now what I can do is I can scrub backwards through all of that data right there in place, standing in the same room. I can scrub backwards, I can scrub forwards. I can realize there's, there's way too much crap. So I can like go over to the panel. I can turn off a particular signal. I can then go back and forth and watch what the events are happening, when they're happening. And then right there in the place, I can go, oh, this thing isn't firing because this particular collider is turned off because there's a ray of light that's coming into the room right here that's, that's causing something. On this kind of like in situ debugging is, is almost crazy important for, for bugs that only happen in a particular room with particular lighting <laughs> and a particular moment, basically. And being able to like just sort of pause right there. So we've made this module, this recording module that you can just sort of drop into anything and like you've got a little recording window that you can kind of go backwards and forwards. The awesome thing is, is hit pause there. You can also like record what would, what would be seen through the device off to the side so that you can kind of like look at where you are right now and also put your finger over in, into, the, into the stream and see the video from the, the device eye view from that part of the stream so you can compare two streams right then and there. And then lastly, this is all in, in world data, but you can bake it out and just call it relative and then just take the data set back to your desk and try and debug some things like from your desk as well, right? And so it, it makes a nice little data set instead of a fraps video in your bug report, you can just re include an entire huge data set and say the bug happens at this time. And, and people back at their desk can try and debug it by, by importing that data set directly. Uh, so let's talk about the ecosystem a little bit. Um, and one, one aspect of this, um, yeah, so, so Brian and I and our organizations, obviously, uh, have been talking for a long time about, um, you know, I think we, we, we have very similar and inverted goals with each other, where we, we are trying to build tools that will let developers make experiences that will work on any platform, right? That's kind of our, our whole thing, right? Um, and I don't want to speak too much for Magically, but generally, the inverse. Yeah, right? we're trying to allow creators to use any engine they want <laughs> to, to make that content. And so in, in the end, like, like we have a particular set of hardware functionality uh, uh, and what Unity is trying to do is trying to basically make a set of, a set of authoring tools that, that are functionality agnostic, right? So you, you not only have to abstract away the hardware, you have to abstract away the features themselves. Like, like so that another human being might be an additional feature to an experience which would lead you to a multi-user, right? It's not just about hardware. And so this sort of abstraction layer is not only gonna allow different devices to run, but different devices with different functionality in different environments that afford different experiences all have to be abstracted out so that, so that not only can the, the editor tell us what it needs to tell us, but that the devices can respond to the things that make sense. I know you've had... Yeah, uh, yeah. from a dev perspective, um, we worked with uh, this project on AirCore, and long, you know, it's, a, it's out on Android, but um, 
you obviously want your game to be across as many platforms as possible, which is one of the reasons that you can use um, tools with Unity and create with Unity. Um, and from you a- You can say the other guys too, it's okay. Uh, you know, well, <laughs> we do, you know, we do work with, uh, for, but um, it's really actually the creating the AR across multiple platforms is not so hard. Like there's no barrier really to us bringing this to iOS. It's more that if you are doing, you're adding on these other modules of sensing, each platform can have its own kind of, um, I guess like ways of doing world sensing that don't necessarily come across. So if you're trying to advance AR, you know, in that way, then that that is more the sticking point rather than like bringing the AR content across platforms, at least in our experience. Well, it's so interesting seeing seeing your app that does all these things that we haven't seen, uh, many things we haven't seen in an app before, and many things we haven't seen simultaneously in the same app before. And I think that <clears throat> seems like it speaks to the the fact that you really dove deep into yeah. into a platform versus yeah. trying to make something. That is, Broad, yeah, right. and that's one of the advantages of diving deep into the platform is that you can push innovation in certain ways, um, but then you are tied to the vocabulary of working within that platform. I yeah. uh, just wanted to show this little table that we have on, on my team. Uh, the y-axis there is um, platforms, whether that's hardware devices or software platforms, and the x-axis is functionality. Uh, so it kind of gives you a sense of what <laughs> what it's like trying to support all these things, and we want all of this to work nicely together. Um, so I just thought it was fun to see. We were, we were jokingly saying that in the 90s we saw this with 3D cards, and in the 80s we saw this with Sound Blaster equivalent cards. So this yeah. is not new either. Yeah, it's not, not a new problem, but an interesting space for sure. Is there anything anybody else wanted to touch on on uh, ecosystem? I mean, I think that what, what you should be, the, big, the biggest part of what you should be taking away from this talk is that the evolution proved just how much data there was and how much we need tools to support the use of that data. I think in exactly the same way that like in the early 90s, let's say when shaders became a thing, suddenly we realized, well, not just shaders, but like bump maps and light maps and normal maps and like, like suddenly the tools to make good art became tenfold more important than it was when you could just make your textures and apply them to your you know, 200 poly model. And so uh, uh, likewise, now in order to, to sort of get the reality flavoring behind all of the things, like not just the art, but the, in, in the interactions and the UI and the placement and all of the things, you have all of this extra data. And so we're, we're incorporating this explosion of, of tools in the ecosystem to try and get our heads wrapped around that and to get people to be back to the productivity level that they've had for a long time now. Because we actually have pretty shockingly good tools nowadays to make screen-based entertainment uh, or, or just regular applications. But those tools are largely, you know, the, the Microsoft Paint of going forward is that in that they are sufficient, but they're somewhat basic for, for the level of data that we now need to push forward with. So let's also touch on, uh, you know, we're, we're talking all XR here, right? Um, but Ron, I know you had some interesting other spaces. Yeah, so in our case, we took the same rule-based system that we developed and, and knew how to solve fairly quickly and tried to see, and, and this is something that I really, really hopeful will happen when Unity will release their uh, rule system, because rules are amazing at stuff that you can't even imagine yet. So we applied it, we, we said to ourselves, okay, so layout of synthetic objects on the real world is one thing, but what if we want to, lay out, to, to create a layout of text over an image? Then we have a set of rules, they are different. Here we have color and contrast and, and font size and whatever, but the idea is the same. So here we took the metadata of the image and, and created a couple of examples that, again, they are not perfect and they are not ready to be productized, but they show you the power of rules uh, uh, as a way of thinking about problems. The way you have a solver, even if it's not a good solver, it gives you a starting point that will allow you to see things differently. That's what uh, uh, we are hoping for. And we, of course, we can't uh, do stuff without machine learning. So we are using the same set of rules to arrange a, 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 to, for furniture arrangement and creation of, of environments because right now we are testing 
machine learning models on completely synthetic render in order to achieve high accuracy object detection. And these are a couple of examples that uh, uh, we are working on right now. They, some of the rules are created by a set of rules, not feng shui, but similar walkable uh, areas, uh, uh, facing TV uh, uh, and such uh, basic rules. And the objects themselves in the scenes are placed using a set of rules to place them in a natural, as much as natural uh, uh, condition as possible. And we are checking to see how can photorealistic rendering right now or, or physically based rendering can help in easily create models such, a pluggable models such as recognize a set of kitchen tools, recognize that in the future to the ecosystem. So yeah. I also found it really interesting the uh, upper right example there where right, using the rules to then generate a layout of furniture, right? Yes. Um, I found that example really compelling in particular because like, we, we really want that functionality where we could just generate you know, a billion rooms to go test your content against and say, oh, your content works in like 80% of rooms according to our generator. Um, but then Brian, I know you uh, had some yeah, opinions I, about that. I just, the, the thing I would watch out for is that watch that your room generator isn't too simple because like it can make rooms that are nice and clean and then your algorithms may only work in nice clean rooms or it might make things that are you know who would ever put a television in the middle of the room and it turns out that in some cultures that's where they always put the television you just have, always have to watch out for implied biases in your in your generators at that point and if you have algorithms that are learning off of those generators you have to you have to watch that the cart isn't pulling the horse and that sort of thing and so um, you know, we, we, we've used this a lot though, like, like, like he said, uh, synthetic data sets end up being the thing that gets you a large corpus of your training and then you, and then you try and layer it with, with, with real data sets as you can collect them. But uh, um, this is very well known in the, in the what's it called, M machine learning you, you know, community. There's, there's formulas for how much synthetic data is too much and that kind of thing already. So, so again, uh, um, this, this sort of stuff is, is, it's just hard problems and there's just so many of them, you know? So it's good stuff though. Uh, one, one application of this stuff that is near and dear for me is um, applying this sort of rule-based thinking to strictly VR applications. Um, you know, right now in, in room scale VR, uh, if I imagine probably many people in this room have probably done room scale VR stuff uh, and kind of the, Arguably the best you can do right now is sort of like fit a pre-built uh, virtual room into the size that your guardian will allow. Of like, oh, it turns out, you know, you're in a big empty room, we can stick a really big virtual space in there. Uh, or, you know, you don't have that much space, so we're gonna stick a smaller version of that in. Um, even that is pretty relatively rare. Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to being able to apply this sort of rule-based stuff to, you know, the system can take your, your guardian boundary shape uh, and on you know, more advanced systems than that, it can take the actual like mesh of the world for headsets that have cameras on them, right? Um, and, and actually you know, give you a full-blown VR experience that also actually matches to your, to your real space, which is you know, just another flavor of the same problem, of course. And there is so much that we could not jam into this talk. Um, yeah, when you think about, Think about like like what I said earlier was you know you have to quickly determine what the rules of engagement are for this particular experience. Well, imagine if there's four experiences all running in the same room at once. Like like how do you how do you tell people that or or do you limit it or do you not or whatever. Like the 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 thing I would say is that this is a very wide open space. XR is huge and it's and it's very infantile and like I would say that if if this sort of stuff interests you there's a huge amount of companies that would love to you know if you love building tools and you love solving problems that nobody has solved yet I would say please come and talk to people because there's a lot more tools to make and there's a lot more rules to to figure out <laughs> and and we need to get to the point where we have those high power tools that that like allow everybody to start making this space because this is where human computer interaction is going. So soon, soon there will not be screens up on, the, up on this wall. 
we'll all be sitting and we'll all be talking and we'll all be interacting with something that's floating around and we'll all have a little copy here and we'll all be talking and I'll be collecting a bunch of stuff over to the side and I'll get flagged eventually that one of your guys' questions is pretty big and so I'll start to formulate an answer and then I'll push it out to the crowd. We'll be doing stuff like this very, very frequently, very, very quickly. I don't, I don't think it's even 10 years out personally. And so like, this is where we're heading. This is why we want to do the things that we're doing because we're sick and tired of watching people walk around with their little screen in their hand and they're not connecting with each other. And what we really wanna do is share compute with each other and share pixels with each other and this is really the only way we can do it, but it's hard. Oh yeah. Um, there's definitely things I could, sorry, <laughs> frog, uh, touch on about like privacy and ethics. Um, I did wanna just back up a little bit to the procedural and the fact that like something that may be useful to Scratch about how um, the Tendar was created in terms of like if you are creating a character and that's not necessarily tethered to a surface, how do you get it to move and act in a room that mm -hmm. it feels more natural? And and that there's a like very complex algorithm behind how the fish swims and moves around that room. And at the point when we were making the app, the this semantic definition of what a wall is was not available to us. So um, one of the ways to get around that is to use the point cloud data. And then um, we were able to like raycast to figure out kind of the boundaries mm -hmm. of the room and generate this nut model so that the, the character can move within that space. So it's a, a mix of like, you know, generating from the procedural. Mm -hmm. That was helpful. Um, happy to also talk about Privacy and ethics too. There's <laughs> Tendar starts with a disclaimer that ever, all the data is on your phone, um, and that is true. It's all models uh, that are just saved to your phone, even though the company is a kind of fictional, speculative fiction that talks about you know gathering emotion. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, I always like having um, permissions, privacy, and ethics on on any talk that we do in the space when we're not directly talking about that, just because it's, it's obviously such a such an aspect of all of this, and you know, it's becoming more and more part of the cultural conversation, which is wonderful. Um, but I just kind of want to bookmark that in there of like, make sure when we're having these conversations that we're also having those conversations too. Um, but yeah, like like Brian was saying, I mean, there's so so much in this space. There are so many unsolved problems, and you know, any of us who are who are like cracking into a particular part of it, we're doing that knowing that there's all this is like infinite amount of stuff on the sides. That, that we're gonna have to address in time as well. So like, I'm sure everybody in this room is doing, you know, is working on, on a particular piece of the puzzle and I'm really excited to see this all coalesce in the next you know, coming years. That's what we got. Thank you very much. And uh, let's, if you have any questions, please remember to use the microphones on, in the aisles there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks <laughs> Total understanding. I have a question. Is this on? Okay. Um, in regards to understanding the diverse worlds that are out there and your diverse users, have your companies found good ways to understand how to make your experiences inclusive? Like, how do you understand the variety of living room setups that are on the world, the variety of gestures that people understand and how those relate to their cultures at scale? I mean, quite honestly, it's just a massive data collection pr program that we're undergoing right now. Like, like you know, every every region that we're going to go into as as a hardware developer, we have to go in and actually find that information out. <laughs> and and in exactly the same way that like when I worked at Blizzard and we put Hearthstone out on 19 different languages, we had to like get all of the text translated to those 19 languages using native speakers. It's sort of the same thing. You have to go out, you have to do the hard work in order to do that. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, I also wanna put it out there. I mean, I know this is, you know, always, always said and always understood, but I, I really wanna underscore it here that like, I think it's super important that you work with people from different backgrounds to be asking those kinds of questions and to be calling things out as they see them of like, oh, hey, that is an assumption right there. That's a bias. Um, so, you know, plus one, always gather your group. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hey, guys. <laughs> Got a quick question. I noticed if the device that you're using is stable, then the animation plays smoothly. But if there's any type of motion, 
it seems very glitchy or is there better stabilization or frame to frame blending? Because if you're moving around there, it, any augmented reality that I've seen so far, it just is kind of jerky. Is there, is that a, a software or hardware or is that something moving into the future that's, mm -hmm. that you guys see being fixed or do you guys don't think it'll be fixed? <laughs> No, I mean, you, you probably have just seen fairly early examples. I, I mean, I see stuff every day that doesn't feel very jerky. And so, like, like the, the thing is, is that especially with, you know, head-mounted systems, the frame rate, frame rate is super important because you're, you're dealing with a physics prediction problem. And the smaller the delta T on that physics prediction problem, the better the prediction. <laughs> and so like the faster the system runs, the better, like, like exponentially better the, the, the head pose gets. And so if you've seen an early system that's running at a rock solid 30 frames per second, it's gonna be jerky. Just because when you move, the predicting model, module can't really predict with, with a third of a millis, you know, with, with 300 milliseconds, where it's going to be. Whereas if it's running at 90 or 120 hertz, suddenly that becomes silky smooth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for devs, the things we most care about in shipping is frame rate and, and smoothness. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Can we switch to this side? Hi. Um, I'm doing a graduate project uh, on AR in the environment. And I was wondering, do you guys, can you recommend some solid resources for us non-engineers who are trying to sort of reverse engineer a lot of the stuff we're finding in tutorials, then they're too old. And so we're just, uh, we're basically trying to do planar target image and GPS tagged 3D objects, so. Yeah, come, come talk after, afterwards and we can toss you some stuff. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult on camera to give you <laughs> recommendations. Yeah, no, it's just working through like, uh, I can name a few people, but we're not supposed to like pick sides. <laughs> Wanted to touch on something you guys had mentioned early on about how to train people to interact with these spaces. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows how to swipe to unlock your phone, but we had to be trained to understand mm -hmm. how to interact with that screen space. So what do you guys see as the future of a design language that we can all mm -hmm. adopt that is easy for people to understand and we don't have to build that into our experiences? Yeah, I mean, that 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 is very, very much what is being built right now. That is That is the the bastion level that is forming under our feet as we run down the hallway, right? And so <laughs> like, like I would say that if you have interest in that work, please get involved in it because like we're, we're building it right now and that is a moment in time problem. I see little kids now walk up to, to stores and like touch the window because they think it's gonna do something. And so like, like they have an expectation right off the bat that a shiny glossy surface means I can do stuff with it. And we're getting to that point now where like I can put a device on people's head and they and they stick their hand up into mm -hmm. the field of sensing right off the bat, which you didn't have even two or three years ago, right? And so it's it's we're getting in that direction, but there's so much work to do. I mean, it took 50 years to get swipe, right? And yeah. so like 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 it's gonna take us a chunk of time to get a good set. So it's a chicken and egg problem mm -hmm. as we develop the tools. Yeah. Whatever sticks best is gonna well, and there's also results. there's also a stepping stone problem. Yeah. People currently have their expectations here based on desktop and, and mobile. Mm -hmm. Here's here's what we could even potentially offer them, but they wouldn't even think to try it. They have to do this mm -hmm. and then you have to give them this and you kind of have to step them up there. And so a lot of times we end up having tutorial levels that have input schemes that are more based off mobile and then slowly you introduce them to the fact that they don't have to use that input, yeah. input scheme. Just over the course of one tutorial, you translate them from nothing to a touch-based thing to a gesture-based thing and then they spend the rest of their time in the app in gestures mm -hmm. and they never even use the touch mm -hmm. stuff. Like, like it, it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sorry. and I think it's a function of both um, how will these platforms be adopted by the, the public because a magic Leap just came out, but you can mm -hmm. see in the HoloLens uh, 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 history, the initialization, the realization that it's not a good yeah. practice, and then the changing of the mind, and the, so it's Going an iterative process somewhere. that, uh, yeah. uh, uh, and because the adaptation is not, you know, it's not millions of users mm -hmm. sending data, we don't know what will work. And we are learning as we go, so. Brian said, get involved. Yeah, certainly. Uh -huh. Well, thank you for um, the answer. And I think it, like in gender, actually, it is a question also of user interface and design on this on particular applications. 
like one of the things we were doing was using like thumbprints in certain ways and indicating graphically that the phone could swivel. But I think that with um, more head mounted displays now, it will be more apparent like the way that people will be trained to look around the world. But when you're making a mobile application, they're gonna still look at it as if it's a 2D monitor. Mm -hmm. So like in order to like collect the emotions, we had to kind of train them a little bit to like actually look around. And it is part of the user, the actual um, graphics on screen. Yeah. I just wanna put out there that um, every day on, on Unity's internal Slack, uh, and I'm sure this is the same at Epic and Microsoft and Magic Leap and everywhere else, um, people are just posting all day. Like, look at the cool things this user's doing. Look at what this person made. Look at what this person made. Um, so yeah, like, please keep making that stuff and share it and tweet it and do all that um, because like we, we, we see it and, it and it does work directly back into the tools that we're making and the conversations we're having and all, all of that. Very exciting. Take it off. <laughs> one more? probably keep going. No. Uh, I'll okay, be quick. I had uh, <laughs> five more, questions, more. but I'll just ask one. Okay, please. <laughs> uh, Device or server-based ML solution for spatial recognition. 5G, is that a solution or we should still uh, rely on the device itself? Sorry, repeat the question one more time. Uh, server-based or device-based uh, spatial recognition. Uh -huh. So you can walk and determine the space without staying in one so, place. So what is the question? <laughs> server-based server or client-based? Yeah, what do you think is going to take off better? Both. Server based both. Or both? both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the heavy duty stuff will always be in the cloud, but you need the responsiveness of on device. Uh, that's what I think. Yeah, I mean even even like let's you know, let's say we did jump to six G. Uh, um, I would say that we, we still have a latency issue, especially when I was talking earlier about the fact that you need in some cases to have really good head pose, 120 hertz. You know, sort of frame rate, and and nothing on the cloud is going to be at that rate for, so it, for, for a long time. Let's say if Google does give you the data of 3D space around you. They do the a Google 3D map, and you can pull the data from Google. Will that help? Oh, sure. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. There there will be a ton of applications where stuff on the cloud makes it down to the device in time, or 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 in a way that makes it super usable. It's just that because of the latency, like like. If I'm going to do completely recognizing stuff on my hand, I don't. I don't want to be sending that to some cloud and then bringing it back down when I'm when I'm specifically trying to do very very hard, fast, precise work. Yeah. Like like off of my hand, let's say. So so the question of, uh, for instance, analyzing a room can be done on the cloud because okay. it's nothing to. It's not very urgent to. I, I can stand like three seconds or four seconds and, until you get a, a result. But identifying your dog running into the room needs to be immediate. You can't uh, tolerate latency there, otherwise things will go very wrong. So yeah, yeah. both right, solutions will be applied. Let's cut it there and take it to the hallway. Thank you very much for coming.